So now let us look at the presentation that I will share with you and hope that you will find helpful. The journey to becoming anti-racist. Moving from the darkness of racism to the light of restorative grace. And if we might pull up the slides. I want to share with you uh, a presentation that I hope you will find useful in having the conversation uh, within your congregations, your members, the people that you minister with around uh, racism. Uh, and so the, the journey to becoming anti-racist, moving from darkness of racism to the light of restorative justice. And so uh, we're going to begin with uh, the next slide, looking at uh, just defining terms. And you're familiar with most of these, race, racism, structural racism. But the one I want to bring to your attention is the trauma of racism. And this is fairly new. Uh, looking at the cumulative, adverse, emotional, psychological, health, the economic, social impact of racism on the lives of people of color down through the centuries, what that it's done to families, to communities, to neighborhoods, uh, within uh, the environment, uh, uh, structures around food deserts, the lack of health care, and so forth. So the trauma of, of racism is something I want to bring to our attention. Uh, looking at the next slide, uh, it's important that uh, we also look at culture and diversity and understanding that uh, culture is very different. We all have our unique individual cultures that shape us as language, values, beliefs, attitudes, uh, and it's articulated within our social structures. Uh, diversity, uh, we know it's the practice of including, involving people from many different uh, social, economic backgrounds, gender, sexual orientation, etc. In the next slide, um, these are diversity determinants. And this is all part of the makeup when we look at the diversity of, of people. Uh, we see skin color, sexuality, age, ability, uh, faith, immigration status, politics, even down to hobbies and interests. These are all part of what we, we look at when we look at individuals and we look at ourselves in terms of our diversity. Next. This uh, quote from uh, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist um, is very important. He says to be an anti-racist is to think nothing is behaviorally wrong or right, inferior or superior with any of the racial groups. In other words, the anti-racist sees individual behaviors positively or negatively. It is not a group behavior. Uh, to be anti-racist is to deracialize behavior, uh, to remove that stereotype that we place on certain groups when we talk about them. Behavior is something humans do, not racists do. That is very uh, important and very key uh, for us to remember. Next. So having the conversations, detours and detour spotting. I believe this is important because it keeps us from having those honest conversations. And so I'm going to just quickly go through what those are and you can spend more time with them and hopefully use them uh, in your conversations. So let's begin to look at the detours. Uh, first, I'm colorblind. I think we've heard that. People are just people. I don't see color. Uh, and we think this is a good thing. It is not uh, because we're denying an individual and who they are. Colorblindness negates the cultural values and the expectations and life experiences of people of color. And by saying we don't see color, we're saying we also do not see whiteness. And this denies the experience of racism and the experience of privilege. So we should not say that we are colorblind. We cannot be colorblind in our society. Next. The rugged individual and the bootstrap theory. And we know this is part of our very DNA uh, within our culture and, and society as Americans. Um, you know, we, we hold on to this propaganda 
if you succeed, you did that. But if you fail or if you're poor, that's your fault. Uh, you know, I believe in, in this is founded in the denial of the impact of oppression, of privilege, of systemic racism, which uh, very much impacts a person's ability to achieve success. Third, reverse racism. People of color are just as racist as white people. And I think it's important for us to understand the definition of racism. Racial prejudice, both white people and people of color can be racially prejudiced. But systemic institutional power, only white people have this to say that people of color can be racist denies the power imbalance and that's important. Yes, people of color can be and are prejudiced. However, people of color have not had the power to enforce their beliefs and institutionalize them to oppress others. Fourth, or, or I'm sorry, let me continue around this reverse racism and the reality check and consequences. Um, it's, you know, it's embedded in the assumption, uh, you know, the playing field is now even. Uh, people with privilege and, and historical access uh, are expected to suddenly share power and it's often reviewed as reverse racism. Here's the assumption that to be poor, pro-Black or pro-any color is to be anti-white. And a, a similar accusation uh, can be directed towards women. We're familiar with this. Women who work to better the lives of women are often accused of being anti-male. Or, as we know personally, as women religious, women who work for equity in the church are accused often of being anti-clerical. Next. And four, we, we often want to blame the victim. Uh, you know, we often advertise uh, everywhere and we say there just aren't any qualified people of color. We've looked for them for this job, but we can't find them. Or uh, if he only had a stronger worth ethic or she uses racism as an excuse for her incompetencies. Uh, you know, he sees racism everywhere. It goes on and on. We want to blame uh, the victim behavior. And this has two things in common. It allows us to evade the real problem, which is racism. And secondly, it deflects from the agents of racism. As long as the focus remains on people of color, white people never have to look directly at racism and their own complicity in it. Next. Another one, innocent by association. I'm not racist because, and we've all heard it and said it, I have Vietnamese friends, or my best friend is Black, or I donate to Casa Latina, or I have a Black Lives Matter sign on the front lawn, whatever. But the reality check is that this detour into denial wrongly equates personal interactions with people of color, no matter how intimate they may be with anti-racism. It assumes one's personal associations free them magically from their racist conditioning. Next. The white knight or white missionary, uh, where we know what's best for people of color. Your young people would be better served by traveling to our suburban parish where they can benefit from a more wholesome environment. What is the reality check? This is the racist paternalistic assumption that well-meaning white people know what's best for people of color. And decisions by white people are made on behalf of people of color uh, because it's thought that people of color are incapable of making their own. Once more, the power of self-determination is taken from people of color. So regardless of the motive, and it may be well-meaning, it is still about white control. Next. Whitewash, okay? Uh, Aunt Susie is really a very nice person. Uh, she just has some bad experiences with Black people. Or that's just the way Uncle Adolf jokes. He's very polite to the Mexican janitor in his building. White people are trapped here by another version of guilt response as they attempt to excuse, defend, or cover up the racist actions of other white people. And this is particularly uh, true when it comes to people that we are close to. We want to justify their bad behavior rather than confronting it and challenging it. Next. 
I can identify with native spirituality. You know? After that sweat lodge experience, I really know what it feels like to be a native person. Uh, this can be very dangerous and very hurtful. It's spiritual or cultural appropriation. And it does pose a serious threat to the integrity and survival of native cultures. Native spiritual practice cannot be separated from native history and community. Appropriating certain parts of native culture romanticizes the lives of native people while denying their struggles, their land and livelihood stolen. Indigenous people now must witness white people trying to misappropriate and misunderstand their spirituality. Next. Bending over blackwards. Of course I agree with you. Even when I disagree, I feel I have to agree. I have to side with Betty. Betty being a woman of color. White guilt shows up as you defer to people of color. You don't criticize, disagree, challenge, or question a person of color the way you would another white person. It's important to understand you can never have a genuine relationship with a person of color doing this. Your sincerity, commitment, and courage will always be rightly questioned. Next. Blame. But what about me? Look how I've been hurt. My people were once oppressed and exploited. No Irish need apply. Again, this diminishes the experience of people of color by telling your own story of hardship. You lose an opportunity to learn more about the experience of racism from a person of color because you minimize their experiences by trying to make it comparable or less painful than yours. Next. Teach me, please. I don't want to be racist. Please tell me what I do when I do something you think is racist. What's the reality check here? White people often assume they can learn about racism only from people of color, assuming that people of color have the energy or the desire to do the teaching. And to be honest with you, most people of color are weary of educating white people about racism. You need to seek out white people before going to people of color. You can't assume that people of color should be grateful for your attempts at anti-racism, that they're willing to help you feel better about yourself at their own expense. Next. This one is called the Certificate of Innocence, where you seek or expect some public or private recognition and appreciation for your anti-racism efforts from people of color. Reality check, if being an ally depends on positive reinforcement from people of color, you set yourself up for sure failure. When a person of color is critical of your actions, you think, if the people I'm doing this for don't want my help, then why bother? I quit. And clearly your commitment to anti-racism is for them and not for yourself. You have not identified your self-interest as a white person for fighting racism. And until you do, you will not stay on this lifelong journey. This is very, very important. You have to see that racism is as destructive for white people as it is for people of color. You have to be vested in this. And you cannot be looking to be patted on the back for doing what is right. Next. Silence. We've all done this. You stay silent. Silence may be a product of guilt or fear of making people of color or white people disappointed or angry. You may be afraid that speaking out will result in losing some of your privilege. Remember, no anti-racist action is taken as long as we are silent. Next. Exhaustion and despair. Sound the retreat. I'm exhausted. I'm only one person. I need to stop and rest a while. And the reality check is that despair is the real enemy of anti-racism. Remember as white people, you can choose to take 
a break from the frustration and the despair of anti-racism work. But such retreat will result in no significant consequences for you. Racism, however, doesn't allow respite for people of color. Remember that one of the privileges of being white is the freedom to retreat from the issue of racism. Next. The journey, and this is a journey. It is a lifelong journey of becoming anti-racist. And it is not a journey that ends. I think we want to be very clear about that. So this is kind of to help us look at the zones and be able to understand where we fall at this point on the journey and where we're trying to go to. That we move from the fear zone to the learning zone to the growth zone. In the fear zone, we, we deny racism as a problem. We, we are uncomfortable with the hard questions. We, we, we want to talk to others who look and think like us. We want to remain in our comfort zone. But when we move into the learning zone, we recognize racism as a present and current problem. Uh, we want to ask the questions that make us uncomfortable. We want to understand our own privilege in ignoring racism, that as white people, we can choose to ignore it. We want to educate ourselves. We realize we need more education. We need more study. We need more learning. We need to be aware of why books are being banned and what is in those books that we need to, to learn. We understand that we are vulnerable and that's okay. Uh, we can be vulnerable about our biases and our knowledge gaps. And we listen to others who think and look differently than us. And as we continue on the journey, we hopefully get to the growth zone where we can identify how we unknowingly benefit from racism. We can promote and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist, particularly government leaders. We can sit with our discomfort. We need to feel uncomfortable. And we are able to speak out, to speak up when we see racism in action. We begin to educate our peers about racism and its harms. We don't let mistakes deter us from being better. We all make mistakes. That's what learning is about. That's what the journey is about. We yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized. We're willing to share power. We're willing to let go of power to create that place, as I said earlier, at the table where there is a place for everyone. And we're willing to surround ourselves with others who think and look differently than we do. So we can see this is a progressive journey. And at times we may fall back, but then we want to move forward on the journey. It is not easy, but we have to be honest and willing to take the risk. Next. So there's always rules for dialogue to have these difficult conversations. First, let's assume that each of us is coming from a place of goodwill and that we're working to achieve a common goal. Secondly, we will allow the expression of feelings, views, and experiences of others without judging them. We will give each other room to make mistakes when trying to articulate feelings and concerns without judging. We will critique behaviors and viewpoints and incidents. We will respect the person even when we disagree with them. Next. This is uh, a song that was written by Reverend Suzanne Olin. How are we to pray? How are we to pray when we have used our knees to take the lives of others. I just share it with you and would invite you to, to listen to the song, which is very powerful and very meaningful. Next. And I want to leave you finally with some discussion questions for your conversation. You know, Think back to what your reaction was to the George Floyd killing. 
was in the midst of the pandemic. We were in clothes. We were watching our televisions and we couldn't believe what we were seeing. What role does institutional systemic racism play in the taking of black and brown lives? What keeps you and your communities from being passionate about destructing racism? What are your fears? These are difficult questions to have, but we need to have the quest to offer the questions and to have the conversations around this. What, what is it that keeps us from being passionate about this? How will you encourage your community to move beyond written statements against racism to restructuring our racist institutions? Most of our communities have written wonderful statements, but they're simply that, words on paper. When, we are, when are we going to begin to live into the statements that we have written? How can we help each other to heal? And finally, what supports would be helpful from LCWR's spirit call within a call? We hope that you will share those with us from your meetings with one another. What you would like to see spirit call do in moving forward to help all of us to become an anti-racist institution. LCWR, our religious congregations, but most of all for each one of us to truly become anti-racist in our beliefs and in our actions. I want to thank you for spending this time and I hope that you will begin to have these honest conversations, but more importantly, that you will move toward action. We've talked enough. We need to put our feet to the ground. We need to take action. I truly believe that the future for us, for our church, for our nation, relies in our ability as women religious to be agents of the gospel, to speak truth to power and deconstruct the sin of racism that for too long has destroyed not only communities of color, but has destroyed everyone, those with power and those without. It's a journey that I'm excited to be on, to be on with you. And I hope that you too are excited that this journey is about the gospel. This is the Emmaus journey. And if we're faithful, we will meet Jesus at the end of the road. So let us not grow weary. Let us continue on. And let us believe that we can make a difference. Thank you.